Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India the ninth lecture of this series of great experiments in psychology. In today's lecture, we are going to discuss a little about cognitions and attitudes. Um, I was, uh, to be honest, when I started these lecture series, it was really tough for me to decide which lectures I should be, uh, which topics I should be selecting, I mean, as the great experiments and studies in psychology. And especially for this cognitive and social psychology, there are so many lectures, uh, so many uh, studies and experiments which are so important uh, that it is very tough to select uh, a couple of them. But uh, what I have done thus is uh, to identify uh, a, a topic and uh, select one of the major studies that were done in these topics. And uh, that is why in today's we have covered memory, we have uh, uh, covered uh, application of memory in law and uh, that is why in today's lecture uh, we are uh, going to, we have also co covered perceptual difference, we were talking about social perceptions. In today's lecture we are going to talk about the influence of uh, cognition on our attitude. So, we are moving from the uh, thought to the action and uh, this is one of the major studies that was done, one of the most famous studies done by Festinger and Carl Smith, where uh, they discussed in 1959, where they were talking about cognitive consequences of forced compliance. So, what happens when individuals are uh, compelled to uh, do something? So, uh, do their cognitions change, do their opinions about it change or does it remain the same. And so, um, basically they started with this question as to what happens to a person's private opinion if he is forced to do or say something contrary to that opinion. So, Festinger uh, came up with the theory of cognitive dissonance. So, uh, we will have to understand the time when this theory was being framed. This is the year uh, in the, this is uh, during the 1950s. So, in between 1957, 1959, this is the time when the cognitive re revolution was uh, coming up in as a response to behaviorism. And uh, the, the dominance of behaviorism in American psychology was gradually waning and the cognitive, cognitive uh, revolution was gaining momentum. So, there were, there were more studies on thoughts, beliefs, attitudes and uh, values and this is where, uh, you know, this is a time when Festinger uh, came up with this theory of cognitive dissonance. And what cognitive dissonance theory states or what it uh, initially challenges is two of behaviorism fundamental tenets. So, one is that mental life as in the thoughts that had no act, no place in psychology because behavioral psychology focused on action okay. and it said that it, it basically uh, focused on the stimulus response paradigm and um, the behavior is uh, stated that behavior is shaped by reinforcement. So, there is no uh, component of thought uh, in our action. So, uh, this theory is a mark uh, of uh, the revolution, cognitive revolution in place, where this theory challenges the uh, action paradigm on the base of reinforcement and it says that any action is based on uh, due to a thought behind it. And the cognitive dis, uh, uh, dissonance theory was regarded as one of the major innovative theories of the time and it became very uh, influential within the realm of social psychology. Thus, it finds its place here in this series of lectures and uh, though there are several other lectures, uh, other uh, studies that could have, uh, should have been included in our uh, lecture series here, but I thought that uh, Festinger and Carl Smith's theory should be uh, introduced. Mm -hmm. So, now let us understand the background when this theory was made, we spoke about the context and this is uh, Festinger was already studying a cult. So, this is um, a cult behavior that happened during 1954 
uh, and uh, he came up with this uh, study of the cult in uh, 1956. And this, uh, there was this lady in um, US where uh, her, her name was Ma Mrs. Marianne Cleach, and she believed that uh, she led a cult uh, that believed that the world was going to end somewhere around 21st uh, December 1954, and all dry land would be deluged and all earthly creatures drowned. And on the eve of the apocalypse, however, and the few Jews, uh, the faithful few who would be would be transported by a flying saucer to another planet. And uh, when uh, they would take up residence over there, unless everything was at peace in the earth, uh, and then they would come back and restore their positions on earth. So uh, when these, uh, so this uh, this um, cult had given up all their worldly possessions, and they uh, they really believed in this. They had faith in this um, um, idea that the world would be uh, um, uh, there would be an apocalypse and everything would be destroyed. But when the predictions were disconfirmed, what would happen? What do you think would happen? So it is um, ob obviously common sense says that uh, everybody would be disillusioned and would fall uh, away from the cult, but uh, that did not happen. A few of them were disillusioned and they left the cult, but most of them were not. And what happened was for the rest of the members, they fell, they came up with another idea. And that was that God had spared the wayward world in recognition of the piety and fidelity shown by the cult members themselves. And this renewed zeal, with this renewed zeal, they started uh, spreading the messages of the cult all the more. And um, they were, that was probably because they needed a social validation. So that is, if other people agreed with them, then their belief was, uh, th that would be a reassurance that their belief was true. So um, instead of everybody losing faith in the ideology, uh, most of them actually fell in with the same ideology and uh, fell in all the more. Now why did that happen? So this basically led Festinger to come up with the cognitive dissonance theory. And Festinger in 1957 proposed that pairs of cognitions, and that is what he uh, means is in, that is inclusive for thoughts and feelings, can be consonant, can be dissonant, or irrelevant with respect to one another. So, um, what are consonant beliefs? So, I have helped the old lady across the street, and I am a helpful person. So, these go together. So, uh, my belief that I am a helpful person is also consonant with the idea that I have helped somebody on the street. So, dissonant idea would be where uh, that would uh, the two beliefs would be reverse. So, I refrained from helping the old lady on the street, and I am a helpful person. So, I believe that I am a helpful person, but I did not believe uh, I, I did not help a person on the street. So, uh, this would be dissonant with each other, and irrelevant could be something like. Um, I uh, help the old lady on the street and I am good at maths or say I am a helpful person, uh, I uh, taught maths in my class today. So these are irrelevant cognitions. Now uh, Festinger said that when does uh, the cognitive dissonance theory uh, basically uh, says that when does a dissonance happen? The dissonance happens when there is an inconsistency between the action and the belief. So, if suppose I am a helpful person and I have not helped somebody on the street, then that would cause dissonance. Now, dissonance is uh, a disturbance that is because of the um, mismatch of the thought and the belief uh, or the thought and the action. And that would, this dissonance would disturb the emotional uh, setup of the individual and that would bring about a change in either the belief, a change in the action. So, the change in the belief would be I am not a very helpful person. So, that is consistent again with the idea that I have not helped somebody on the road. A change in action would be I have helped another person on the, I have helped a person on the road. So, that would be consistent with the belief or uh, the change in action, change uh, changed action and perception. So, 
that okay it could be uh, like in this situation I did not help because there were other people who had actually gone ahead to help that individual or I give some other reason to myself to explain that my uh, to miss to reduce the mismatch. So, what is happening is in either ways I am trying to reduce the dissonance and when either of these happen. So, there is a change in belief, there is a change in action or there is a change in the action uh, perception then there is a redu reduction of dissonance. So, the cognitive dissonance theory states that whenever there is a dissonance in our minds that is when there are two uh, there are two existing beliefs or two uh, a belief and an action a thought and an action and when they are at clash with each other the idea is the to reduce the uh, dissonance we try to do something to uh, to bring down that um, disturbance or dissonance within us. So, what we can do it either by action or by changing the way we think. Okay. So, um, this has been actually uh, supported by other studies during the time and Janus and King they reported that the private opinion changes so as to bring it into closer correspond correspondence with the overt behavior the person was forced to perform. And Janus and King showed that when we are uh, they basically uh, did an experiment on um, improvising a speech supporting a point of view with which the individual disagrees. And they showed that if the, in the improvised speech that the person does not believe in if he is made to uh, give reasons uh, during his um, expressions uh, as to um, as in you know he, he finds out new ways to um, rationalize or uh, say things to support his dictum then uh, he there is a change of opinion and there um, they start the individual actually starts advocating that point of view that he is that he was previously against. So, the observed opinion change is greater in people who perform mental rehearsal and think up new arguments than for persons who only hear the speech or for persons who read a prepared speech with emphasis solely on execution and manner of de delivery. So, what um, James and King uh, Janus and King tried to show was that if you start uh, when you are really improvising and thinking up uh, reasons uh, while uh, expressing your opinion as in uh, speaking for a point of view then you start believing in, in it. But if you are trying to do it very mechanically right just reading from a script or um, and you have more focused on the delivery uh, and uh, rather than the points then you would be quite detached from the idea. And uh, the uh, in this way the they propose that the person who is forced to improvise a speech convinces himself. They present some evidence which is not altogether conclusive, but we will uh, they say that the there is several other things that can be discussed about the experiment actually you know. Uh, if you if you just uh, come across uh, if you come across the idea of role reversal this is exactly what is done in role reversals. Uh, well, uh, if uh, a very simple thing uh, that uh, we generally practice is make the student a teacher and the teacher uh, play the enact the part of a student and you have to give uh, logical and realistic arguments. So, it is like a debate where the student plays the role of the teacher and the teacher plays the role of the student. So, there is a role reversal and you actually debate in supporting your role. Now, uh, you will gradually see that the moment role reversal has uh, shown to be a very very active uh, way of conflict resolutions. It is practiced in several management um, um, management research also in fact uh, as a, a way of uh, conflict resolution in the um, organizations. So, basically you start taking the other you start seeing the other po person's point of view and how because when you are putting in arguments which is at dissonance with your own idea then uh, you start uh, trying to adopt those those ideas and 
the other dissonant ideas and you change your uh, views towards that dissonant idea. When you are supporting that view, you are changing your to reduce the dissonance, there is some sort of a harmony that is created between the views. So, you might not change uh, from your position completely, from your belief system completely, but you would definitely uh, be less intense about the point of view that you hold. And uh, the you would probably uh, try and have more faith in the other's opinion also. So, role reversal it, it follows exactly this theory. Now, uh, the cognitive uh, dissonance theory, uh, it um, uh, Festinger wished to actually test it in an experimental situation. So, he created this hypothesis that the larger the pressure on participants to elicit particular overt behavior that is beyond the minimum needed to elicit, the weaker will be the tendency to change their opinions. So, to bring them in line with that behavior. Now, I will repeat, please understand this very well. His hypothesis was that the larger the pressure on participants, so the more the pressure on the participants to elicit a particular overt behavior. So, overt behavior means an outward expression of behavior. So, if there is a larger pressure, if there is a more pressure on the participants to elicit, to express a particular outs outward uh, behavior, then the weaker will be the tendency to change their opinion. So, the probability of these people changing their opinions will be less, so as to bring them in line with that behavior. Now, this is very much in contrast with what we were saying so far. We said that if an individual uh, has a different point of view and he is uh, supposed to uh, uh, come in line, he, he is uh, representing the other point of view, then he will have some harmony. So, his opinion will gradually change. Now, this statement is saying something different. Now, this is because the Festinger's study in 1959 was a little different from the first study. So, what was his work? He said that how much of actually pressure or how is actually required to change the opinion. So, if there is, he wanted to test that. So, he saw that if there is, his hypothesis was that if there is too much pressure to change the opinion, there will not be a change in opinion. But if there is less pressure, then perhaps there will be a change in opinion. So, let us see what he did. So, he um, so he would he would present individuals with uh, uh, one dollar or twenty dollars for uh, telling another participant who was actually a stooge with the experimenter that the task they were waiting to perform was really interesting. Now, um, I, I hope uh, you know what a stooge is. A stooge is a part an individual who is actually a, a confidant of the experimenter. So, he uh, the subject or the participant who is the real subject of the study has no idea that the stooge is uh, known to the experimenter before and he is actually working with the experimenter. The part the subject or the participant that is he sees the stooge as another uh, participant just like himself. So, mm, the stooge actually helps uh, to enhance the um, activities during um, um, an experimental situation. It helps, he helps with the uh, conducting of the experiment and also acts as a participant most of the times. So, uh, here uh, what was the task in question that these uh, participants had to do? So, there were uh, 71 male student volunteers who are from the introductory psychology course in Stanford. They were selected to uh, perform, participate in this experiment and they were informed they had to perform a two hour experiment dealing with measures of performance. And what was the task? The task or of measure uh, for of performance was that they had to um, involve putting two, 12 spools. Now, these are spools, I have put uh, pictures of spools on to a tray emptying the tray, refilling it with spools, emptying it again and so on. And after doing this for 30 minutes, the participant was given a board containing 40, 48 square pegs and the task was to turn the pegs a quarter turn clockwise, then another quarter turn and so on. And this also they did it for 30 minutes. So, how do you think how interesting is the task? Actually, the idea was to make it as boring as possible. 
okay and uh, this task was definitely boring so it continued for one hour so half an hour of uh, putting spools on a tray and removing it and putting it back again and the other half hour was spent in turning the pegs okay so um, hey, the uh, the idea was to give them a very negative experience very boring experience of the whole situation and then so that is what the thought is after the that is that is what was trying to be induced that this is pretty boring now these individuals would have to say something different so uh, they would be in required to say to another participant that this is a very interesting task so what was uh, done now the the group was divided into uh, three uh, three subgroups so the controls were not asked to do anything else except that they were going to be interviewed as part of the departmental study okay so that was one group the other uh, was um, experimental 1 and 2 where uh, the experimental 1 uh, both were told that they would be they would have to uh, say it to the other participants uh, that this was a very enjoyable task they had a lot of fun Uh, they enjoyed themselves it was very interesting it was intriguing and it was exciting so there was a script so uh, this was absolutely tailor made and uh, the experimenter told uh, the participant that there was another uh, individual whose task was to go and say this to new participants but unfortunately he had not come so he was requesting uh, this participant to go and say um, read out from this script and uh, they would be paid uh, so the condition the two groups one group would get 1 uh, for saying all this and the other group would get 20 dollars and after this uh, they would have to answer and uh, uh, complete an interview schedule that was a part of the departmental study just like the control group so uh, they were once the participants had agreed Uh, to this request they were paid either 1 dollar that is from the condition experimental condition group 1 and uh, $20 for the experimental group 2 and participants had been randomly uh, put to the three conditions out of the 71 students uh, 60 were actually there for the final study the others uh, had um, left for some reason so um, uh, after signing the receipt for the money the participant was taken by the experimenter into a secretary's office and where a female stooge was waiting so this is the experimenter's confidant okay but the sub the people the subjects or the participants actually don't know about it so then the participant made some positive remarks about the experiment to which the stooge responded by saying that she was surprised because a friend of hers had done it a week before so this task of picking up pegs and turning the pegs and picking up spools uh, she said that uh, she was surprised because a friend of hers had told her that it was a very boring task now they were supposed to uh, say from the script so that so most of the past participants responded by saying something like oh no it's really very interesting i'm sure you will enjoy it so like um, control participants those in the experimental groups that's both the groups who got 1 dollar and 20 dollars they were taken to another office where an interviewer was asked if he wanted to interview them as part of the departmental study and they were interviewed and um, the interviewer was again blind so as in um, now that means that he wasn't aware in which group the participant belonged so that is whether he whether the participant belonged to the control group whether to experimental condition 1 or experimental condition 2 so the interview consisted of uh, a few questions and four questions primarily on a on an 11 point scale so they were asked were the task interesting and enjoyable did the experiment give you an opportunity to learn about your own ability to perform these tasks from what you know about the experiment and the task involved in it would you say that the experiment was measuring anything important that is do you think the results may have scientific value and would you have any desire to participate in another similar experiment what do you think the results would be so were the tasks interesting and enjoyable just ask yourself if you were asked to do one of these tasks of picking spools and dropping them 
and then just turning the peg and doing it for more than half an hour. One task for half an hour, the other for another half an hour. So it's around an hour's time. Do you think you would find the task interesting and enjoyable? Would this experiment give you an opportunity to learn about your ability to perform such tasks? And if you were in, uh, do you think this would be measuring anything scientifically important? And uh, would it have any scientific value? And would you actually wish to participate in a similar experiment later? Now, let's see what happened to the results. If you asked me, I would have said no. Now, that is if I had belonged to the control group. But if I had got either $1 or $20 for it, what would happen? Now, let's see what happened to the group. So, it was seen that uh, most of the, uh, the, the $1 group experience greater dissonance. So, most of the mm, control group people, they, uh, they were very clear that they did not like the task. Okay. Now, the what happened um, to the $1 group? So, the, uh, for the two experimental groups, the dissonance was produced by uh, telling someone how interesting and enjoyable the tasks were and could be reduced most directly by persuading themselves that they really were interesting and enjoyable. So, both the experimental one group that is a 1 dollar group and the 20 dollar group they tried to convince themselves that this is an enjoyable task. Now, let us see how convinced were they. Okay. So, only you will see that uh, the 1 dollar group is pretty convinced while the control group and the 20 dollar group they are absolutely not con convinced that this was an interesting task. Okay. So, mm, why, why do you think there was a difference? The difference was because they had to justify themselves and for the 1 dollar the, they, they experience greater dissonance. So, if you have taken money and how can they justify lying about the boarding task for just 1 dollar. So, the, the funny thing is that it, this would the, the task so, they try to make the task more uh, interesting to themselves. So, they try to convince their thoughts or convince their belief that this task was actually not as boring as they had uh, they thought initially. So, it is pretty, pretty interesting. And if you see that for the scientific importance also, this group, the one dollar group uh, gave a higher value and even in to participate in a similar experiment only for uh, this, how much did they learn? Hmm. So, this was uh, probably uh, the only way place where they got a lesser value. Now, uh, let us see what happened with the 1 dollar group. <coughs> see, for the, mm, uh, so now the idea is uh, the first belief that the individual has is I am not cheap and do not lie easily. So, now with this, the, there is an inconsistency when I do a boarding task and I lie hmm. because I am not cheap and I do not lie easily. So, then I, shall I only lie for 1 dollar? So, that is that is really cheap because I do not lie easily. So, now there there is a dissonance hmm. and the boarding task becomes fun. On the other hand for 20 dollars what happened was it is uh, I do not I am not cheap and I do not lie easily. Okay. So, this is consistent with the idea that it is I am lying for 20 dollars. Now, this created low dissonance because it is too far fetched. Okay. I, I the my idea and my already my idea about myself and the idea uh, the, the, the position that I have to take up a new these are uh, these are completely discrete now. So, it is not creating a dissonance. So, I there is no change in perception. So, it is ok I am this is a boring task though I take the money I say no it is a boring task. But uh, for uh, if it is of a lesser value say for the 1 dollar group they felt uh, it would be cheap to take money and not lie because it is a very less amount of money. Now, so, the conclusions that Festinger uh, drew from this experiment was that when participants were induced by offer or reward to say something contrary to their private opinions, this private opinion tended to change so as to correspond more closely with what they had said. So, the greater the reward offered, 
beyond what was necessary to elicit the behavior, the smaller the effect. So, every time a large amount of reward need not bring about a large amount of change in behavior. Now, this theory is very important because it is actually uh, counterintuitive. So, the what is counterintuitive? Counterintuitive means that it goes against the common sense. The common sense says that if you get a lot of money, then you will change your opinion and say uh, whatever is required. But uh, this theory is it goes against the uh, common sense theory. And the, mm, here, so this finding was actually replicated by several other studies in children and where they were given either a mild or a severe threat not to play with an attractive toy. Now, it was seen, this was done by Aronson and Carl Smith in 1963, and it was seen that the, if children obey a mild threat, they will express experience greater dissonance, because it is more difficult for them to justify their behavior compared with children receiving a severe threat. Now, uh, this, uh, this was also done, uh, 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 you know, uh, supported by um, other theories, other uh, research, and Totman in 1976. Uh, did a wonderful experiment with patients where the illusion of choice over medication was given to them. So, the patients were asked uh, whether they wish to take this or that and uh, it was their decision. And strangely, when it went, when the uh, when their decision was followed, it had beneficial effects. The medicine was more effective because the individual was more committed to it. And now, this uh, is also, uh, this has been, uh, you know, in re real life also, um, you will get to see that if you, uh, this is one of the primary principles on which the faith healers work on. So, they will tell you that if you have faith in it, it will work for you. So, it is more like, uh, you know, if you have less dissonance with the, with a new idea. So, you just have to change a little bit to uh, bring about harmony, then you will do it easily. So, it is, uh, you know, this is, this theory is very different from uh, the common sense point of view. And actually, you know, this is why the experiments in psychology are so important, because they show you that not always uh, it, uh, you know, in an experimental situation or, you know, when we actually do scientific experiments with it or scientific studies with it, uh, do, is our common sense view supported. In fact, that uh, the common sense view for most of us would be that if you give somebody a greater reward, he will work, he will do better he will change his opinion, but that is not always true. And Festinger in 19, Festinger and Carl Smith in 1957, holds 19 importance today. And a lot of studies messages, you know, when especially through media, through media or in persuasive message, it is always done in little parts in bits because then it will not change the opinion so easily opinion so easily. If you wish to change somebody's opinion, subtly induce them to act at all own free will. So, they are taking their own decisions. These tactics work because people readily rationalize objectionable actions for which they feel responsible by adjusting their attitudes to match them. Thank you.